Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Leboff, and joining me, as always, are my friends and colleagues, BJ Cunningham and Anthony DeBundo. We just wrapped up a pretty fun day of uh, Champions League, and now we look ahead to the wonderful world of the Premier League and beyond. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on every single Premier League match coming this weekend, our last weekend before an international break. Then after we go through those 10 matches, we'll touch on Bundesliga, La Liga, Serie A, Ligue 1, uh, give out a three-leg underdog parlay. This one comes out at a robust 155 to 1, uh, and then give out our, our favorite bets for the upcoming match week in the Premier League. But before we do all of that, a reminder that Wonder Goal is presented by Bet365, and Bet365 doesn't do ordinary. It believes that every sport should be epic, every tournament, every game, every point, every play, from the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. See for yourself when you sign up today with promo code ACTION, and you'll get $365 in bonus bets when you bet just $1. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. You must be 21 or older, and you must be present in Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, New Jersey, Ohio, or Virginia, and if you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, please call 1-800-GAMBLER in Colorado, Kentucky, New Jersey, Ohio, and Virginia, or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms and conditions apply. All right, fun week of Premier League soccer to, to look ahead to here. We'll start on this on Sunday, the 11.30 a.m. kickoff between Chelsea, Red Hot Chelsea, uh, we were trying to tell Anthony that the Spurs team was punching above its weight all season long and that it, that their reckoning was coming and it could be coming through via Chelsea or a team like that. And he said, no, no, no. But uh, he, he, he learned the hard way uh, when Chelsea paced its Spurs 4-1. The Blues now host the Sky Blues, Man City. Chelsea's plus 400 at Stamford Bridge City, minus 134, an odds-on road favorite. The draw is plus 260. Anthony, you and I are on the same page here. I think that this is a decent spot uh, to look at the underdog. Yeah, so the market has moved in the last 12 hours. Uh, we're recording this Wednesday night. It's a good thing we're not recording it Wednesday right after the kickoff of the of the games because I was uh, shaking violently during the Champions League today. Uh, what an epic sweat on some of those late games. Copenhagen forever. But uh, as far as this game goes, you know, red cards again. Just every big match this season, the Premier League, there's there's just red cards, and we never learn anything. We got like 20 good minutes of soccer, and then chaos ensued. There were two red cards, three goals chalked off, uh, another red card review that could have been won. You know, it was an, an absurd contest. Uh, you know, Chelsea finished with four XG, and you have to, you know, of course, weight it down with Spurs playing a, a high line at the halfway line down to nine men. But I do think that if you go back and watch, you know, kind of how that match played out, there was only really one chance created at 11 on 11. And it was the clear scoring opportunity for Nico Jackson. And I think there is something to be said for Chelsea being much better when they don't have to try to break down a low block and they get to play on the break a little more just because of how their talent is suited. When you think of like Mudrick and Jackson and Sterling, these are players who are good running into space more than they are good breaking down technically with precise passing. And you saw that with Jackson, I thought. Uh, so, you know, do they get enough time on the ball in the midfield to exploit City here? What kind of approach does Pep take? We've seen, you know, Guardiola kind of tweak with lineups here and, and mix and match. Jeremy Doku has been dynamite for them. He was excellent in the match against Young Boys on Tuesday. He was also great uh, over the weekend in their demolition of Bournemouth. So, you know, it seems that City has figured some things out here, as we expected they would not overreact to just a little bit of a blip that they had. But uh, from a numbers perspective, I, I only make City minus 112 here. So I do think they're a little bit short, but now that the market has come down, right, went from minus 155 all the way down to minus 125, 130 now at, at most books, uh, I don't have enough for me to go to Chelsea here. So uh, I'm going to be passing unless it gets back up to that qu three quarters of a goal. I kind of need the three quarters uh, because I, I have um, – City as a you know close enough favorite once you take out the VIG that it's not really a, a plus bet for me to make either side. And I, I think that you know Chelsea is clearly trending up. And like I said, the defensive press was really good against Spurs before the Reds, uh, but not quite good enough of a number yet. So 
I will be passing at this number. Uh, yeah, I, I think Chelsea on, on the money line is worth a look. And um, I don't think it's going to shorten too much more. I think the, the only other direction this line moves is towards City. The money camp comes in on Chelsea, and then we'll we'll see when the resistance comes from the market to push it back up. But uh, like we've known kind of throughout this whole season that Chelsea, their, their main bugaboo, like the, the process looks fine, just that they – don't score, which is a pretty important thing in in soccer. Um, and uh, if they do figure it out, and the, the game got wonky with Spurs, obviously, but if they do figure it out or they have their their scoring boots on, they they can play with anybody in in, in any league. That the inverse of that is that they can lose to anyone if they don't have them on. Um, but the underlying numbers look good enough here that. I'm I'm willing to take a shot that that maybe this Chelsea team goes into the the international break pretty hot and uh, I will uh I haven't really bet against City on the money line much this season so something I did to to just great success last year uh I'm I'm probably going to going to hop on with uh Chelsea here BJ Yeah, I agree. I'll make it 3 for 3. Um I think the match against Arsenal in my opinion is the best that Chelsea has looked out of possession against a good build up team. I thought they did a great job of disrupting Arsenal's build up play, forced a lot of high turnovers in that match and what Pochettino did is he didn't really play a lot of strikers. He, you know, played more of wingers, midfielders and played a 4-4-2 and essentially just said, "Okay, we're not going to have the ball in this match, so let's just try to play out of possession, play in transition and force those high turnovers." And it worked. And they were for large stretches of the match, the better team. The biggest thing for me is Anthony mentioned with Doku and Grealish right now. They are just cooking guys in 1v1 situations because obviously City loves to overload the middle of the pitch. They get those guys in one guys in one-on-ones. They can beat their defenders and create chances out wide. Chelsea against Tottenham started Levi Colwell and Reese James. Those are two really good defenders in wide areas who can give Doku and Grealish some problems. So I think Chelsea's plan, and obviously having Enzo Fernandez and Caicedo in the middle of the pitch, helps when you're trying to face a team that wants to play through the middle. So I think the defensive setup for Chelsea can give City a lot of problems. Now, City out of possession is kind of interesting because they're actually being a lot more passive this season than they have been in years past. They're 12th in passive per defensive action right now, 12th in opponent buildup completion percentage allowed, 8th in high turnovers like that's not what we're used to seeing from City. Yes, they've pressed some of the bad teams and forced them. But if we look through City, yes, they've looked great the last four matches. 15 goals. They're just they're cooking all of these bad teams. But the two matches before those four were against Brighton and against Arsenal, which they, against Brighton, they scored early twice. And then for the second half, they got outplayed. And against Arsenal, it was a very even match with just not a lot happening. But City only took four shots in that Arsenal match. So, uh this is a a spot that I think it's 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 a decent spot to fade them. I'm with Anthony. I have City at plus 101, so decent edge on Chelsea plus a half at plus 110. I would like to see plus 115 for a little bit more juice, but I mean, listen, Chelsea's played three big six sides this season, plus Brighton in the League Cup. They haven't lost any of those matches, so they they clearly are good enough to hang with City here. So, uh yeah, Chelsea plus a half if it gets to plus 115 for me. Yeah, that's the thing, right? If you were to say, what were the whole season, all in all, what were Chelsea's three best games? You'd probably say opening day Liverpool. Yeah. You'd probably say Arsenal. Mm-hmm. And then you'd probably, I mean, a League Cup is so corny, but yeah, uh, you'd either say Fulham or you'd say Spurs. But I mean, Spurs was also kind of fluky, but like they had taken control of that game after the deflected goal. So... There is something to be said for the fact that you played your three best games against three of the toughest teams you're going to play all year, three of the teams that will hold the most possession against you. Uh, and I think that's worth something when when you see how this Chelsea team plays. So we're getting close to the Chris and Kunku return. They're thinking December mm-hmm. for him. So he may be back for the festive period. That would be a fascinating experience going forward and, and might be uh, might be really interesting. All right, uh, Wolverhampton and Tip Top Tottenham. <laughs> Next, uh, Wolves plus 225 at home. Spurs plus 115 road favorite uh, in the draws plus 260. These odds obviously are from our friends at Bet365. Uh, 
VJ, I, 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 got nothing I, I want to talk about what happened during the Chelsea Tottenham match with the market. Cause it's maybe one of the most insane things I've ever seen uh, yeah. since I've been betting soccer. So obviously Madison or excuse me, the Romero red card happens. So he's out for the next match. And then simultaneously Madison goes down and then Van de Ven pulls up with looks like going to be a long-term injury of his hamstring. And I was watching the market. I know Anthony was too. And I was trying to bet Wolves plus one. And I had it up there, and it was because Tottenham was minus 150 coming into the match uh, over Wol- against Wolves. Which and, was too high to begin with. Which was too high to begin with. <laughs> and Tottenham crashed all the way down to one point at plus, just plus 120 on the money line. They moved 70 cents in the matter of maybe like 15 minutes. It was one of the most insane things I've seen since I've been betting soccer. Um, so the point of it is that I think this is an opportunity to maybe pass or potentially buy low on Tottenham. Uh, we're going to see a makeshift back line, obviously with no Romero and no Van de Ven, which is concerning. But again, Wolves doesn't have Pedro Neto. So uh, that's also concerning because it, now, listen, Wolves can play good in transition if Tottenham wants to play a high line. That's the concern here for Tottenham. But it does look like James Madison might play in this match, which Tottenham's attack would still be pretty much full strength. So going up against a Wolves defense that has largely been below average this season, the price on Tottenham may have gone a little bit too far. Um, we're not there yet. You know, if this closes, you know, somewhere around plus 2025, plus 130, maybe I'll hop back in on, on Tottenham and just try to, you know, break even in this match. But yeah, I, I think the value's gone on them from what happened in that match. But this is a good match if you're somebody who's like, you know, I understand it's the standalone 7.30 a.m. match, but it is a really good match to just watch Super. and learn of what Tottenham's going to be like without these two center backs, honestly. Because with the Romero red card, that's going to be three matches and Van de Ven's going to be out for a long time. So I'm going to watch and I'm going to learn and I'm going to see what Tottenham is like when they're full strength without their two main center backs. Yeah, we're expecting a Van Deven update Thursday from Mr. Postacoglu. Uh, not sure about that yet. He has not, uh, nothing's been reported, but yeah, you figure that's at least a month. So, you know, the system that I so I waxed poetically about last week, <clears throat> where I said, well, yeah, they're playing this high line, but look at how good they've improved the defense with Romero, Van Deven, and Udogi. <clears throat> well, all three of them will not be playing in this match. Uh, Dyer and Hoiberg, like, <laughs> it's Ben Davies, maybe Ben Davies. I yeah. So you know, it's just not as it's not as youthful. It's not as athletic. It's not as dynamic. Uh, there's not as much ball winning. So I, I think there's some real questions about how, you know the biggest question we have with Spurs. And we said, look, like they have this advantage. They're not in Europe. They're playing one match a week for the rest of the season. They have no depth, and now the lack of depth is glaring because they had like four injuries slash red card suspensions in a week. So, you know, we'll see with matters if he's out, like it gets really thin with this attack because Richarlison is now out. Uh, Brennan Johnson has been okay. Kulisevsky is not going to give you a ton of shots. So it really starts to get like, this is an average premier league team and an average premier league team should be plus plus one twenty on the road at wolves. So I think the market's right now, but you're never going to see those those minus money prices and uh, yeah, you know, like that look ahead line was too high anyway. I would have been on Wolves for full strength Spurs too. So uh, I think Wolves, you know, they didn't play as well. They weren't as clinical, maybe, but they still created a good number of chances against Sheffield. They just didn't finish them, and then they got you know varred um, or p- penaltyed in stoppage time, and they gave up two shots in the first 80 minutes, one of which was the goal from 30 yards out. Like they, I didn't think they played bad against Sheffield. So I, I don't really downgrade them from that loss. It's a fun game for us. Uh, Arsenal now playing minus 500 uh, yeah. at home to Burnley 16 Burnley. to one. The draw is plus 550. Almost pitch a shutout today. Yeah, yeah they've been doing one, that. One, one shot for Sevilla in the, the very end in stoppage time from outside the box. It's maybe like you know this defense is actually really good, and maybe we're just not focusing on that. Well, are, no, this, I, I don't think we ever. I don't think we against the attack. 
Yeah, I don't think we we we, we did c- criticize the defense at the end of last year when they yeah, started to terrible. be bad. Terrible. Cliff dive. Um, you're just asking way too much of a team that doesn't score enough, generate enough mm-hmm. at these kind of numbers. So it's it's. But but honestly, okay, I, Burnley I, stinks. I, I understand that point, but Burnley's style of play leaves them extremely yeah. vulnerable, and open to yeah. get absolutely waxed in this match. I get it. Yeah, if yeah they I was just about playing, to say, like they they they. I have st- no interest in the dog here. Yeah, they no. stink as a. I, you're, I you're so if bad. you if you would like just given me if given me Luton down at this number, I'd be like I'd, I'd be sure. pumped. I'd be yeah, you know. But Burnley are kamikaze, so. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to bet that kind of underdog. I will bet almost any underdog. I've been betting the San Jose Sharks. Uh, <laughs> they won last night against my. They flag. did. They did. Um, of course. And I, I will say this: uh, if you do li- like hockey and you want to listen to a, uh, our betting <laughs> podcast called Line Change, you should. We, we tomorrow's Sharks Oilers game is the, one of the betting events of the season. How were the Sharks? Same game parlays and stuff like that. But uh, I digress. Um, you, if if a team's gonna play. Arsenal, like in a stoic, pragmatic way, so. they become very, very interesting as an underdog at these prices. If they're going to play like they're... Like they are Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, like they're Barcelona 2006. <laughs> like, I don't... Who's who's the Lionel Messi at Burnley? Like, what is uh, going on here? Decent. I'm Dooney. Yeah. Putting up some okay numbers every once in a while. Coleo yeah, he's he's the, he's the difference maker here. Just get the get the ball on his feet. He can beat Arsenal on his own. Uh, no interest. I have some interest. Um, it's one of my favorite bets. So I'm just going to bet it here. I did it last week and it worked. Both teams score no minus 150. I don't see how Burnley scores here. I really don't. I mean, I talked about it last week. They are averaging 0.87 non-penalty XG per 90 minutes. If it wasn't for Sheffield United, that'd be the worst in the Premier League. And... Given their style of play, their build out of the back, pragmatic, try to play the ball through the lines, that's not going to work against one of the best out of possession and pressing teams in the entire world. And the problem with Burnley is they don't know how to play another way. This is the only way they know how to play. And it's very, very clear that, especially out of possession, that they are set up to high press and try to cause turnovers. But they're not good at doing it. They're... 12th in passes per defensive action, uh, 14th in high turnovers. Like for a team that's going to press the front four, that's that's terrible. Plus, Arsenal defensively is maybe the best team in the world right now. They are so, so good. And if you look at their last three matches, Sheffield United took, took two shots, combined 0.03 XG. Newcastle, if it wasn't for the controversial... Gordon tap in. Newcastle would have created not a goal. It would if it was not, not a, goal, a goal. Newcastle I've would have for twenty years. It was not a goal. It would have created 0.46 expected goals at home, and then in, like Anthony mentioned today against Sevilla, one shot in stoppage time. That is a grand total of, ha- of essentially. If you take away the Gordon goal, that's essentially half an expected goal in their last three matches. That is an incredibly impressive mark. And this defense just doesn't allow you to get out in transition. If you, you, you can't build up through them because they're too good at pressing and they're still good on set pieces too, which Burnley's not great at those either. Burnley. Okay. Here's the trivia question for you guys. Burnley scored three goals away from home this season. Two of them came against Luton town. Who did the other goal come against? City. No, that city was at home. Yeah. Bournemouth is, is the answer to that question. Okay. Um, Burnley also hasn't, they've, they've played all the big six teams at home. They haven't played on the road this season at a big six club. They, when they went to Newcastle, they got stomped. So I, I really don't see how they score. Now, as for Arsenal, no Odegaard is concerning right now. He's uh, a very, very big gap in the middle of the pitch. Everts hasn't really been able to, solidify that role very well. Um, it's been just a lot of Saka and Martinelli out wide. Um, I thought Arsenal offensively looked good today. They actually tried to play through the middle of the pitch, which was an encouraging sign. Um, but 
this could get really out of hand if Burnley just keeps trying to press and keeps trying to build out of the back and continues to turn the ball over. So both teams to score now, minus 150, uh, projected at minus 184. Uh, one of the biggest edges I have on this slate. We, we haven't had enough of those from BJ this year. I know. It's because La Liga became a high-scoring league again. Yeah, they I know. It's unfortunate. Um, you know who I think Burnley is going to be live against? Who? Everton. At, well, uh, Everton just pumped them in the League Cup. Yeah, I know, but that's the League Cup. I think Burnley that, had one shot in that match, I think. It's, Everton it's is live Cup. against everybody because they're really good. Yeah, well, we'll <laughs> talk about them right now, actually. Uh, Palace plus 140 hosting tip top Everton plus 200 coming off a 1 1 draw against Brighton. Uh, I played the goals, yeah, they did. They did. I mean, nobody nobody comes to Goodison Park and out, out plays this. this Everton At some team. point, we're gonna have to do the Charles Barkley meme dialogue about Bar Brighton. Maybe we'll save that when they play a good team again, but it's not been great. No, no. yeah, well, we um. I like Everton here as a as a two to one uh, dog on the road. We love betting Crystal Palace as a underdog. Not wholly interested in, in them as a as a favorite even at home. And like this this game can go in a lot of different directions. I think you've got one team that is much more pragmatic in, in Crystal Palace, but at home, like they should be, and against a team like Everton, they should be a little more swashbuckling to borrow a phrase from uh, our friends overseas. And that should play into to Everton's hands. But as Anthony just said, like Everton is just playing really well. So uh, they, I think that they're a better team than Crystal Palace right now, especially with the injuries. Uh, Everton's been healthy for a few weeks now and Ducore might be hurt. Didn't seem like a big deal, but even so, like they've got enough bodies in the midfield in the middle of the park that I think you, uh, they'll be able to survive that one. Uh, what do you think, BJ? I think I'm going to pass, and I think we need to talk about what Sean Dyche has been doing the last few matches. I understand they went up on Brighton early, and they played very, very low, very, very defensive, and it worked for pretty much the entire match. But even the match Same before that against that. West Ham, it was a very relatively boring match. They didn't really do their normal high pressing. If we can go back further, obviously against Liverpool, they got the red card and uh, basically had to defend for their lives the entire match. But so is Dyche going back on his old ways? Or is he done? No, I think that? he's just very he's adaptable. He's a, he's an adaptable manager. Like he's he's, he's he's one of the few I think that goes into yeah every like each match and is happy to. Tinker. No, I think I think there's absolutely a little bit of that. I think I think the difference now, and it's kind of weird, right? Because we, we talked about Everton in the early season. We were like, well, the attackers stink, but they're still creating a lot of chances because they're so open. They're forcing more people forward because the attackers stink. And then the good ones came in. And now Dice is saying, well, we don't have to attack with as many people now because the ones we are attacking with are better. And thus, we're not doing as much attacking and we're still kind of squeaking by, like, you know, they, they, they pressed Brighton early in the game, but then very much sat off, sat deep in the, the entire match. This is the kind of match where, like, I don't really love a pregame side, but I think either side goes up a goal, you got to look for, like, a live under. Because Palace yeah. can shut it down and, and, and make it really hard on Everton, who s- still, even with the way they play, is very route one, prefers to have the other team have the ball. And Palace says, go ahead, have the ball. Do d- challenge you to break us down, and Everton on the on the opposite front. Like we now have a couple of games where when they do take the lead, they are sitting off a lot and not really committing numbers to you know creating those high turnovers. And they're not a build up possession team at all. So no. if they start every possession in their own half, it's hard for them to score. They need those high turnovers to create chances. So uh, yeah, I think this is like from a pregame perspective. I have I have Everton above Palace now. I have Everton as the 11th best team in the Premier League, uh, which is about Palace. But I think the line's kind of right with Palace at home here. Eze is back, so that's encouraging for their attack. Like, they, they, you know, they're going to have somebody to carry the ball forward. But uh, I don't really think this is a great – like, the under two and a half is super juiced. 
So like if you get like an early goal and you can get a three juiced, love it. Uh, don't really see how this game becomes particularly open because I, yeah. I really think whoever does get the lead, their defense, either by numbers or by talent, is good enough to to kind of grind this game. So I don't really see a ton of scoring. If you're an older listener to Wonder Goal, um, we're happy. First of all, we're happy to have you. And if you're a fan of old school tactics, this is the match for you. None of this, none of this new school, high pressing, high possession, build up structure. Just route one, play the ball long. Let's win some duels in the middle of the pitch. And that's what you're going to see pretty much for all 90 minutes. So this definitely, I agree with Anthony, live under is the, the only way to play it. All right, time for the game of the week. I am so excited to bet Luton Town against Manchester United. <laughs> United minus 300 at home. Uh, the Hatters coming in at 8-1, to one, and the draw is plus 425. I think there's a couple of ways here that United loses this match. One, they're not very good. They're not good defensively. Uh, two. Seems like a good reason. Yeah. And, but like, so that's their, like the, the actual play, on field play. Number two is got kind of a lame duck coach situation, lame duck manager. A lot of times in other sports, well, you, you'll see teams kind of uh, lose the plot a little bit as play their like manager out. <laughs> And it's so toxic. I, I would, I would, if I'm Man United, I would have much rather this game be at Kenilworth Road or played in Riyadh or in, in Boca Raton or something because the last place on the planet I'd want to be on Saturday is at Old Trafford. They're going to get booed as they come out. If they were if they were playing hockey in Canada, there'd be a jersey on the ice. Like this is so bad, and Luton Town's buoyant right now. Like they've been decent for relative to their expectations. They're coming off maybe their most impressive performance in in the history of the club, a one one draw against Liverpool, in which they were uh, relatively unlucky to not get out of there with three points because it was a classic late winner for wow. the late equalizer for, that, for Liverpool. That's one way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> Darwin look, Nunez would, would would disagree with that statement. Anyways. The point is I say this a lot. Who on earth is betting Manchester United at this number? <laughs> well, it did come down a lot today. It did. As it should. I wanted to bet I wanted to bet Luton, but then it came really far down and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's a flat one and a half. Now that being said, uh, how many matches do you think United's won by multiple goals in the league I, this so season? I was d- digging into this. I did an article on the New York Post uh, for their match against Copenhagen. They they beat Crystal Palace by three in the EFL Cup. It was a they beat team from Palace. Yeah, and it was they they beat Burnley by one, Sheffield United by one, B- Brentford by one, Fulham by one, Copenhagen by one. It it's Forest by one. Forest by one. It's it's. By the slimmest, like, this is an exaggeration, but a couple bad bounces for this team, and <laughs> they're in... They've gotten every good bounce. Yeah, they're in 15th place. But, uh, you, take away two of those wins. Well, take away two of those wins and give them draws, and they're, uh, they're on 14 points, or and they're at you know in 13th place in the league right now, and... Uh, you know, and no one's gonna, no one's in relegation trouble outside of you know the, 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 the those four teams that we know. But this is such an unimpressive team right now, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna quit on their manager. If Here's soccer matches were only Go ninety on. minutes, they would have what? They five, would have lost to Sheffield. Five points. Yeah. They would have the, lost. They got the draw. Yeah, Fulham, Sheffield. They tied Fulham. They would have lost to Brentford. So yeah, yeah Brentford. I'm not points. Sheffield. Brentford. I mean, they would have tied yeah. Sheffield. It's they would have now. To be fair, they would have tied Arsenal as well. That's true. So, give a little bright spot there to United. That might have been their best performance of the season. But yeah, no. I mean, essentially, if you're laying United minus one yeah. and a half here, you're asking them to do something they have not done all season long, which is beat a Premier League team in a Premier League match by multiple goals. Without Casemiro, without Luke Shaw, without Lissandra Martinez, without now Johnny Evans is out as well. Um, 
Imagine saying that was a big loss. I know, but I'm like, I okay, it's well, today, though. Like, it's now you, it's you, just, you go down yeah. man, but you're up two goals. And they just exactly. completely capitulated. And that's the problem. That's, they're not that's, good. That's they're not good point. at like it's, it's 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 not even just the like the numbers are bad, but it's it's a perfect storm of the numbers are bad and the team just you know, eye test, sniff test, whatever you want to call it. There's no backbone here and uh, how how do they they run away? They they scored what in the third minute today? And I'll be honest, up until the red card, they actually looked really, really they good. They played all right, yeah. They were moving the ball very, very well. It was a lot of quick passes. They were moving the ball between the lines. Like, it would actually looked like the best version of what Ten Hag wanted them to play. And then a red card happened, and it, they just completely fell apart. It's like, it was just like they went down like three men instead of one. It By was the way, crazy. We got, an, we got an opening line for the return trip to hell. About <laughs> Marcus Rashford in three weeks. You want to guess what United is on the money line for that match at one book to put it up? They are they are they a road favorite? They are. Oh my Even god! Money. Yeah, I was gonna say that. What? Yeah, that's crazy. That's but insane. like Michael said, anyway. I mean, if Ten Hag's fired, we might yeah, have to so, completely yeah, throw out the true. numbers and bet them. And and I already bet my, that. Right. If you follow me in the app, then you know. My uh, my this this is a manager managing for his job. Like they lose to Luton, he's done. It's the international break, perfect time to. Just cut ties, bring in Big Sam for the rest of the season, keep him up, <laughs> and go from there. Give it, give it to Sam for the rest of the year. Um, it's such, it's such a mess, and such a good opportunity, I think, to to sprinkle a, a big money line. I, and I know it's moved, but I'll up the Hatters, man. This is yeah, this one, is such a good spot last to try thing, to pick at these bones. One last thing I'll say: Manchester United. If you just strictly look at expected points, they have overperformed better than any, more than any team in the Premier League this season. And what has it got them? Eighth place. Like that's how bad it is right now. They should be in the bottom half of the table, but because of some late luck, essentially, they are somehow sitting in eighth place. Would you look at that? I just got a notification in the award winning Action Network app that BJ Cunningham is betting. Well, I didn't realize we had openers yet. Plus a half. <laughs> Yep. Against Manchester United. Yep. Three it's crazy time. line. Welcome to hell. Uh, all right. Uh, let's move on to Bournemouth and Newcastle. Now, uh, the Cherries at home, four to one. Newcastle traveling at minus 150. The draw is three to one. Um, not a good showing for our boys uh, from Saudi Arabia over uh, over the no. midweek going to Dortmund and losing. Pretty. It was pretty. That was the thing, right? We talked about it. We were like, well, like eh, they might rotate and they might be dead because they played a war on Saturday. And Every, they were dead. everybody's hurt. Yep. Yeah. yeah that was a terrible now Bruno's game. suspended here. Yeah. He got a yellow card accumulation. So he's down. Dan Burns going to be out a while. It's like, who's who with Ishak and Wilson? Like Callum Wilson's gone. Well, Ishak's gone. Wilson's in. Wilson, is he? I thought, I thought, uh, well, he's like, like at least a doubt. Right. Um, so, the market's I don't know, come down pretty hard here. And I don't play, I mean, you have, I mean, they ran out of players here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I actually don't think Bournemouth is out of control, uh, to play him. I, I am not going to, it's the, but it's the worst matchup possible for Bournemouth, though. Like, yeah. I understand <laughs> the has nobody. The hamstring for Wilson. Yeah. I, I understand they have nobody, Saturday. but it's the worst possible matchup that Bournemouth could have in the Premier League against really anybody. Like outside at home, game. though, and again, like the Newcastle legs, like the press doesn't work as well if everybody's dead. But they're they're playing off though a little bit. They're not pressing as high anymore. They're playing this four five one and being more passive so that they can get through this grueling schedule. But yeah, um, if you if you're someone who follows my projections, I'm projecting like so much value on Newcastle. I haven't adjusted it for injuries yet, so. Um, I would not bet that at its current number. Um, the only thing I would look at here, but if Wilson's out, I don't know if I can bet it would maybe be over three. Um, Who's just, sco- who? What is the striker? Anthony play? Gordon. Get it Get it to Anthony Gordon. Gordon. Alvaron and probably Joe Willick would be my guess. That's not a lot of shots. Nope. Alan, Alan Shearer. <laughs> you're not getting the Bruno ball winning. You're not getting the Bruno ball progression. Like that means Sean Longstaff is on the ball a lot. And like Bournemouth could press him. Yep. And it's some turnovers, and, and I mean, maybe over. 
feels like Newcastle gets picked off maybe, but the line did come down a lot. So yeah, you know, it's the same price they were against Wolves like two weeks ago. Yep. That was That's what two two. Yeah, pretty even game. Villa and Fulham. Uh, Villa's minus one seventy five, hosting the Cottagers, coming in at plus four fifty, uh, and the draw here is plus three twenty. Uh, I'm just gonna. I think I'm my New Year's resolution uh, is gonna be just to pretend that Aston Villa uh, doesn't exist. Uh, so I'm gonna be passing here, BJ. Why is that? I just yeah. can't get them right. I don't think I've won a bet on them in. Yeah, last week you had the trees, right? The trees, yeah. But I, I like that's true. That's the first time oh, I ever. Here's what I'll say. Here's what I'll say about Aston Villa. Time, I, I pulled up my numbers on on them, and um, this is the second time I beat Villa all year, and the only other one was the EFL Cup when Everton yeah. beat them. <laughs> um, and, and I don't even know if I, I I want to count the trees because we had them in the in another heartbreaking money line, our underdog money line yep. parlay that that Anthony was like Sheffield United is already dead, and the real. <laughs> The real killer was that Dortmund didn't even get off the bus against Bayern. Again, Um, we had that wonderful moment, the 90th minute penalty or 99th minute penalty. We're all celebrating. I didn't even get a chance to watch. I didn't even get a chance to watch Bayern and and Dortmund because by the time I was getting ready to get settled in and watch and have a nice sweat, Anthony's team already had puked all over themselves. Anyways, yeah, nothing for me here, Villain Fulham. But Anthony, you have a play though. Yeah, I grabbed some under three, minus one twenty five. It has moved up a little bit, uh, so it's like minus one thirty five ish now. Uh just continue to think that these Fulham totals are getting crazy. Uh and they're not warranted to be this high. Uh, you know, they they played United in a game that was so open, but the attacking quality was so bad that they only got to one point seven expected goals. There was a lot of opportunities in transition there at, at the Craven Cottage. Uh, but Fulham has been considerably more uh, passive away from home. And that's what I've noticed. I thought they were very defensive against Brighton and Spurs in those matches. Again, two games totaled at three that ended under three, ended with two goals each in those two games. Even their game against Chelsea, there was one really bad error uh, deep in their own territory. But again, like stayed under and there just isn't enough goal production in this team right now. Like they're, they're kind of scrap scrambling to find who the striker is going to be and no, none of their options are working. Like, so they, they bring in this kid, Rodrigo Muniz and he's 22 and his shot numbers were not very good thus far. 0.25 XG in, in, you know, two nineties. Uh, he comes from, you know, the, the championship. He had an okay season at Middlesbrough, but like this guy is not ever put up good enough numbers for me to trust him in any kind of sample to think that he's just going to walk into a Prem team and be a competitive quality striker. So I'm not really buying this situation with Muniz and the the production around him, like we've talked about it, it's reliant on Willian and, and, you know, Bobby Reed. And it's like, these guys are, you know, well past their primes at this point. So, you know, how long do we expect him to keep that up? Not very long. So the result is that, you know, Villa, their home and away splits are so different. But one problem that Fulham has had has been playing through pressure this year. They have had some bad giveaways. And they're just not going to have that problem against a Villa team that doesn't really press. So as a result, I think uh, I think this game plays out a little bit flat. I think the Villa numbers are generally inflated. Like the fact that they were priced at the same total as Spurs and Fulham is crazy to me, given that I think Villa's de- attack is just not as good as Spurs. So uh, I like the under here. I think it's too high. Okay. Our friends at Brighton are struggling right now, but they are still a robust minus 400 favorite. And that's because mm-hmm. they're playing Sheffield United uh, tip of the cap to the blades for their performance last week. It feels like months ago, uh, 12 to one on the money line for a two uh, to back the blades to go on a, a two match winning streak here. And the draw is plus 450. You alluded to it before uh, that Brighton looks a little suspicious, I guess. Uh, eh, they're eh. Yeah. Eh. I, I, none of us have a bet here. aren't pressing so them anymore. Keep... That's the problem. They're just playing low blocks, and Brighton hasn't yeah. been able to figure it out. Secrets out? The secret's out on how to play Zerby. Just like, I think it's because he's trying to keep it vanilla 
um, and not give away his secrets because he knows that Eric Ten Hag is about to be kicked to the curb after they lose to Luton. Why would he and go to he's... United? I don't know. He'd be it's one of the dumbest. A... Like, yeah. I understand. Um, but what are the, these, that's what all these managers do. I know. It's like, that's not enough. Think of, why would Graham Potter go to Chelsea when a, that sociopath took it over? And, uh, nothing here. Um, yeah, Anything? nothing. Yeah, nothing here. Brighton's kind of struggling to break down low blocks. The one thing I will say, and it's crazy enough to to say this right now, but Brighton unders might be might be coming in here in the next few matches. If you look through their last Finally. few, I know. Again, I got that one, and I said I it again. Yes. After a while. Well, to be honest, Anthony, combined, there hasn't been over two point five xG created in their last four matches. One point six with City, one point five with Ajax. 2.1 against Fulham, and then a robust 1.2 against Everton. Now they play Ajax on Thursday uh, in Amsterdam, so that'll be a very interesting litmus test because Ajax is in completely desperate right now, um, and they're going to have to play aggressive. So that will be a very, very interesting match to watch. But, it, you know, a Sheffield United team that's going to play a low block, who's not very effective in doing so, this will be a good litmus test for how good Brighton is at doing that because – and Brighton's next match is on the road against Nottingham Forest. So if they are not able to effectively break down the Sheffield United low block and create a lot of chances, it should not give you much hope when they go on the road to face Nottingham Forest uh, after the international break. So this is a pass, but if you're somebody who is like enjoys tactics or, or trying to figure things out, watch how Brighton tries to break down this low block. And if they're not effective in doing so, it's just another problem that we're going to have to write down and, and maybe we can put, start playing some unders because they do have Forrest, Chelsea, Brentford coming up in the Premier League after the international break. Yeah, I would okay. lean toward the goals here, but like 146, uh, 140, minus 140 to lay a goal and a half. Like, no, no thanks. Uh, just a reminder, this will be our last episode before the international break. And then when the international break gets back, it's time for the busy, busy festive fixtures. Mm -hmm. uh, things will get quite crazy around these parts. Um, and that also means the holiday season is right around the corner. And that means it's time to get busy. But don't let that stop you from sticking to your habits and being the best version of yourself. And that's where our friends at Caldera Lab come in. One minute in the morning and one minute at night can be all the difference you need to achieve clearer skin and a better feeling about yourself, better self-esteem as you go into the holidays. These guys, Caldera Lab, are the best in the skincare game right now. They have an easy routine to keep your face looking fresh no matter your schedule. It's just three steps. One, the clean slate, which is a face wash to start and end your day. Two, the base layer, which is a daily moisturizer to hydrate your skin. And number three is the good. It's an eye serum that you can put on at night to help your skin look tighter and smoother. And what's a better gift than clear skin? A little bit of a discount for clear skin. So when you join the 100,000 men who trust Caldera Lab to show your best self this holiday, you can use our exclusive deal if you use the code GOAL at calderalab.com for 20% off right now. That's 20% off with the code GOAL, G-O-A-L, at calderalab.com. Make unforgettable impressions this holiday season with Caldera Lab. Two more matches to go. Fun one here. Liverpool. Brentford. The Reds, minus 250. The Bees traveling at 6-1. to one. Uh, The draw is 4-1. to one. I, I think it's just... I, I'm, I'm obviously going to be betting Brentford here, mm -hmm. uh, BJ. This is a team that... A, they're really good. B, they're really good in these spots when they're punching up. But you look, if you look at their their underlying numbers, their form is also red hot, right? 3-0 three, three against Burnley, 2-0 against Chelsea, and then uh, a 3-2 uh, kind of white-knuckle win against West Ham uh, to get them to four wins on the season. But they're sixth in the Premier League in expected goal differential per 90. They're creating chances. Defense is a little worrying. Uh, you know, it's middle of the table. 
and going up against this Liverpool attack that creates scoring chances for fun. But they've given them problems before, so I actually think yeah. that this is a fine spot to back the bees. It is, and Brentford is one of the few teams outside of the big six that can give Liverpool effectively problems because of how good they are in transition. So I think the, you know, the Chelsea Brentford match from a few weeks ago is not a perfect uh, comparison, but a pretty good one on what Brentford does. You know, Chelsea for the first half and up until when Brentford scored, wasn't really creating a lot of big chances. It was just a lot of shots from distance, Brentford blocking shots over and over again. And then Brentford, who didn't really attack for most of the first half, got free a couple times down the wings. One cross goes in. Chelsea miscommunicates on the back post. Pinnock puts it in. And that's kind of all she wrote for the rest of the match. Liverpool is still not good in transition defense. It's still a problem. And especially in this match, with the midfield that they're going to have out there, Brentford should be able to take big-time advantage in those transition opportunities because Curtis Jones and Alexis McAllister are both going to miss this match. It looks like Gravenberg is doubtful and Thiago is still out. So you're going to have some type of makeshift uh, midfield with, it might be with Taro Endo as the ball stopping midfielder. Obviously Soboslai will be in there and maybe Cody Gakpo, but it's still not a lot of great ball winning in the middle of the pitch. And, the biggest thing of why Liverpool is bad in transition defense, especially against these teams like Brentford, is because when they invert Trent Alexander-Arnold into the middle of the pitch, well, once they lose the ball, he's not a great defender in transition. So there's not only space out in wide areas where Konate and whoever is playing on the left, this at this point, it'll probably be Joe Gomez or Samikas will be my guess. They've been cooked in those type of scenarios, and it leaves a lot of open space for teams that can get forward and play down the middle. So... Brentford, who has obviously Wiesa and Mbwema, who are very, very good in those transition opportunities in 1v1 situations, can give Liverpool a ton of problems. And Brentford also should have really good advantages on set pieces here. They haven't scored many this season. They've only scored twice, but they have created 6.1 expected goals off of set pieces. That is by far and away the most in the Premier League. So they're a little overdue to score there. Liverpool in the bottom half of the Premier League in defending set pieces. So... Just another really, really good opportunity here for Brentford, who, you know, if you look back to their last match against Liverpool, the one at Anfield, I know they only created 0.2 XG, but there was a couple very, very close VAR situations where Brentford, I remember, scored one, but they were like a toenail off because of Liverpool was playing their high line. So Brentford should be able to exploit that. They're they're still doing an outstanding job of closing off the middle of the pitch in their 5-3-2. So uh, it's going to have to be a lot of, Sala and, and whether it's Diaz or Jota, whoever's playing out on the wings of trying to create those chances from out wide and in and Brentford's really good at defending their penalty area. So uh, Brentford plus one and a half minus one fifteen. Yeah, it's uh, just a classic Brentford spot. Our friend Stucky at big bets on campus does the, the bit about service academies catching two touchdowns or more and how they win 60 plus percent of the time. Yeah. And th- this, this is kind of the thing with Brentford, right? Like, We know we're not always going to win. Nothing's always going to win. But way more often than not, when we back them against these big teams, they come through for us. And the market is perennially undervaluing them. And if you look at it, like, yeah, if you just looked at straight XG difference per 90 in 11 on 11, this season, Liverpool uh, non-penalty is the best in the league, edging out Newcastle and City by like the slimmest of margins, plus 1.25 per 90. Well, Brentford plus 0.55 per 90. So they're an excellent team and they're catching a goal and a half here. So I think it's too high. Liverpool probably wins. Better team at home. But even when Liverpool exploits teams, they've still managed to find ways to get in transition against especially like Forest. If you go back and watch how they beat Forest, Forest sat very deep and they still got beat in transition. I don't the think Brentford <laughs> is going to give them any, no. any opportunities. They're more disciplined than Forest. So... Uh, yeah, I, I like bees, of course, as always. The bees and the trees, just the two teams I bet every week hey, right now. Let's do it. The bees and the trees, baby. I'm on the trees. Uh, the bees, the trees, the toffees. That's uh, those are Anthony's. <laughs> the, the the holy triumphant. And, and then and the not Spurs or Arsenal. Yeah, uh, West Ham and the trees, Nottingham Forest. Uh, Hammers, odds on at home at minus one eighteen. Forest, 
traveling at plus 320 at the moment. And the draw here is plus 260. Uh, West Ham coming off of that disappointing loss to Brentford, uh, which they blew a lead. Forest coming off of a, a big win uh, that against Villa. We were on them. Well deserved. Forest is climbing. Look out. Uh, but yeah, I think that this is a, another good opportunity to, to bet this team against a, a West Ham side that is just having oodles of trouble right now. Uh, defensively, which is not what you'd expect out of uh, a David Moyes side, but the only team that have allowed more expected goals than uh, the Hammers on the year, Sheffield United, Bournemouth, and Luton Town. And that's translated to uh, actual go- actual goals against two there. Six from the bottom and tied with Brighton at 20 goals allowed. So I think this is uh, your trees. Anthony, your your boy Steve Cooper, you've been telling us this whole time. Great manager, finally yeah, BJ and I are him. seeing the light. Never doubted him. Yeah, I just think this is the perfect like. What the hell is West Ham gonna do? They keep starting Antonio. We talked about this last week. They're not. He's not getting enough shots. It was actually really hilarious because they would have had a tap in to go up three one, and Antonio took the shot from his teammate and made a harder chance out of it and missed. Um, but. You know, uh, Kudis is real, though. That's really impressive, yeah. and I'm excited to watch him. And he was a live wire player and, and somebody who's very dangerous, so certainly has to be considered uh, with Bowen and Kudis. You know, can they make up for Antonio? Maybe. But they will get Pakata back. But this is such a brutal spot. I mean, they are playing two matches every week. They don't have the squad depth to do it. And the trees, you know, they get Taiwo in there, and he looks lively early. The midfield was really good at just sitting there and daring Villa to break them down. They couldn't. And, you know, we talk about Forrest, 20th in pass per defensive action, 20th in box entry, or final third entries allowed. West Ham doesn't want the ball. They're not good with the ball, and they're not very good at breaking down teams who give them the ball. So this is the kind of matchup where I worry about, about West Ham because they are one of the few teams um, – who look extremely vulnerable in transition. I mean, Brentford had odd number breaks every time they wanted. There was no ball stopping at all. So I think Forrest gets the same recipe that Brentford did. Do I think Forrest is as good as Brentford? No, but uh, now I get a dog price. I get to catch a half a goal uh, instead of laying it with the bees last week. So give me the trees plus a half. I know how bad their road numbers are. It's the only thing that's kind of scary here. Mm-hmm. There you are plus or minus 0.93 per 90 away from home. And, you know, we talked about last year, like it was pretty ugly there too. But again, just this Hammers team and the way they profile being so bad in possession uh, and, and so bad at tilting the field, you know, like Forrest can probably just play their way to an even game here. And unless bounces go against them, they're probably going to get a result. I mean, here's the thing is there has been a couple instances this season where West Ham has played as the team that's going to control more possession and try to break down a low block. It happened against Luton Town. They created one expected goal. It happened against Freiburg in the Europa League. They created one expected goal. It happened against Everton a few weeks ago. They held 64% possession. They created 0.7 expected goals. So I agree with Anthony. What is West Ham going to do? Are they really going to break down this effective low block and stop Forrest going forward and transition effectively? No, they're not going to. So this is a good spot here for the trees. I don't know who's laying minus 125. They also have a home match against Olympiacos in the Europa League on Thursday. So they're going to be a little bit gassed here, especially going into international break. So I don't know who's laying minus 125 with West Ham. So uh, yeah, Nottingham Forest, plus a half, plus 105. I agree with Anthony. All right, that wraps up the Premier League. We'll revisit them at the end of the show uh, with our best bets. Now onto the Bundesliga. Uh, quick anecdote. I was at the bank uh, the other day, and I heard some guy talking to the teller about Heidenheim and, mm, and, and Stuttgart. Yeah, they're uh, so they're the worst defensive I, team in Europe. They're so fun. I I couldn't I couldn't like get the context of the conversation, but I heard him say both. He had a pretty thick German accent. So, by the way, uh, I think Michael, the highest total I've ever seen in one of these top five leagues this weekend, Bayern and Heidenheim is four and a half. That's the highest I've ever seen. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty close to being straight too. So that that Byron fraud stole another result today. They did. They did. Not did. Cover. did not cover. 
we'll get them we'll get them in the in the final with with Galatasaray. <laughs> um, what do you guys have for the Bundesliga? Yeah, you can go first, Anthony. Stuttgart, pick them at home, minus one ten against Borussia Dortmund. Uh, where do I say? Where I mean, who's the better team? Because I will posit that Stuttgart is the better team, and they're pick them at home because we now have a quarter of the German season played, uh, more than a quarter, ten of the thirty-four matches. Uh, and Stuttgart's expected goal differential is plus 1.22 per 90. And I know they've lost the last two matches, and I know that it conveniently fits in the narrative because Jirasi was out, and Jirasi has scored 14 goals in the first eight matches. He was scoring at a, a god mode rate. But in the two matches without him, they created 3.6 XG against Hoffenheim at home, and then went to BJ's boys, Heidenheim, and created 2.6, which actually isn't that impressive because uh, Heidenheim is conceding 2.5 per match. I know. But either way, the market has given them a huge downgrade because Jirasi's out. And look, I get it. Like, he's very good. And, and I joked that he was the best striker in the world two weeks ago. And for the first month and a half, he was. But, like, this attack is, is still cooking. It doesn't matter whether he's there or not. The system, underlying system is really impressive. The, the box entry data is better than Dortmund's. Dortmund's transition defense is still a nightmare. I know Newcastle didn't do shit against them, but like they went to the yellow wall with, they started like pretty much bums. Like it was a, it was a really bad attacking group from Newcastle that went to, to Dortmund uh, in that match. So I, I just really don't buy it. And I think that this defense still stinks. I mean, you look at like their numbers this season, 2.4 to PSG, 1.6 to Milan, 1.1 to Newcastle, 3.2 to Bayern, two to Frankfurt, like where they they just haven't been good defensively and look I got suckered in last weekend and bet them at home thought they'd give a good showing they didn't but like BJ talked about this on the Champions League show like the, the hole is very obvious where it is it's just, they don't have any ball winning Emre Chan is still hurt and so I think Dortmund should be a dog so yeah Stuttgart love them at home here minus one ten pick them yeah I like uh, Cologne on the road pick them. Plus 120 against Bochum. I don't see why Bochum should be a home favorite here. I mean, Cologne, if we go back to last season and we just take the priors coming into here, Cologne was around an even expected goal differential. They underperformed quite drastically, while Bochum was around a minus 0.7 XG differential per 90 minutes. So that's a pretty decent gap between these two clubs. Again, we've played about a quarter of the season, and Bochum is still sitting at a minus they're now at minus 0.85 actually differential per 90 minutes so they have not improved they're not any better their defense is still conceding chance after chance after chance and suddenly the market is now saying okay these two teams are actually kind of even on a neutral field which i don't believe to be the case whatsoever the process numbers for cologne are still there they're just they just can't put anything in the back of the net and that's why they're in last place first and final third of box entry conversion rate offensively so they're getting good transitional opportunities and getting the ball into the box they're, cr they're crossing at a top five rate. They're top seven in expected threat, top six in shots. Like this offense is still very, very good. Again, they just can't put the ball in the back of the net for whatever reason. So Cologne, pick them plus 120. Projected them pretty close to a pick them here against Bochum. And also the Leverkusen Union Berlin line is, is quite crazy, uh, yeah. to say the least. Um, I've done a pretty good job this season of just avoiding the Leverkusen train because they are just trucking everybody right now. Uh, probably the best form of anybody in Europe. But the Union Berlin defense has drastically underperformed. They've, in the Bundesliga, they have conceded about nine, they've conceded 19 goals, have about 13 expected. So I am projecting a little bit of value on the under. Leverkusen has ran incredibly hot offensively. Could see some regression in that. Um, but again... I don't know if I want to stand in front of the train this week. That gets a two. I will be betting Union Berlin. It's one one and three quarters right now. It's crazy. Uh, I make it under one and a half. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll go to La Liga next. Uh, PJ. Las Palmas. Plus there a half. Are. There they are. Shout out. What is it? Humble country lawyer. Shout them out. Shout them out here. Um, P.O. P.O. Las Palmas plus a half against Osasuna. Uh, I think we need to talk about Las Palmas really quick because 
They are holding, on average, 57.9% possession in the La Liga this season. That is more than Real Madrid. Now, to be fair, they're doing nothing with it. <laughs> That's Because they are dead last in expected goals. They've created literally nothing. It's all just been off of penalties. But they are an outstanding defensive team. And they're a very, very good high-pressing team. They love to counter-press. And they're really effective in doing so. They've created, they have the most shots off of forced high turnovers. They're only allowing 0.97 non-penalty XG per 90 minutes. And this Osasuna offense has done literally nothing this season. They're bottom three in expected goals. Uh, they're not very, very good in transition. You know, they're they're starting to kind of become this uh, possession dominant team who likes to counter press and press high as well. But the, one of the reasons why Las Palmas is holding a lot of possession is because they are very good at playing through pressure. So uh, if Osuna decides to press them high quite a bit, Las Palmas should be able to play through them. But really, should be a pretty big stalemate here, and one maybe you could play a, a zero zero draw. But again really no reason why Osasuna should be a uh, odds on favorite here at home against a really good Las Palmas defense. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's such a fun situation with Las Palmas it Canary, is. And, team from and, the Canary Islands. Exactly. Like traveling. We traveling haven't talked to, about the travel to the Canary Islands too much this year, Michael. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll get into it a little bit more. We, we left to, We love to talk about Majorca going to the Island yeah. of Majorca. How about traveling uh, you know, to, to basically Southern our, Morocco. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> Oh uh, God, um, Anthony. Anything in La Liga? I mean, my biggest value is on the board. Yep, same, Friday. Same same team as always. Yep, I'll be on them too. They're catching a goal at Bilbao. It's crazy. I make it point six one. And I also like the first half team total over plus two hundred. I don't even want to say their name. It you know the saddest part. You know, we talk a lot about CLV, uh, and you know, as a as a gambler, I look to obtain this CLV, and so the initials cash of the store. I could cash it in with the merchant every weekend uh, yeah. when I lose, but he never he never cashes it in for some reason. But uh, <laughs> the initials of this beautiful team are CLV. <laughs> <laughs> and and last week. You know, we bet them pick a minus 110 against Sevilla at home, and they close like minus 145. They dominate the first hour and a half, hour, 15 minutes. And then they get a red card, and Nasiri scores. And then I'm like, all right, push, whatever. And then they give me that glimmer of hope. They get a VAR call. They get a, a penalty in the 95th minute when the guy's arm clearly gets dragged down. I'm like, yes. They'll probably miss the pen, but for right now, I'm going to dream <laughs> about them winning this match. VAR says no. Sorry, Celta Vigo's playing. They don't get the penalty. Again, I mean, we've talked about this a couple times now. Just add it to the list. I mean, they are getting, like, historically screwed by the officials. Uh, like, VAR calls, reds, uh, overturns, disallows. Everything you could possibly have go wrong for them. It's gone wrong, and yet the underlying process is so damn good. Over two and a quarter XG against Sevilla. They're an above-average attacking team. I love everything about this Vigo team. I think they're really trending up. I think the market is so wrong on them, and they're going to pay eventually once they start getting these goddamn VAR calls to go their way. Uh, and you know what? Maybe the refs are they'll know and they'll they'll feel bad. They'll give them one. So Vigo team total over a half first half plus two hundred. Vigo. Vigo. Uh, one minus one eighteen. I love it. I mean, I got to look at the schedule to see how many times I'm going to bet this team in the next month, but uh, could be fun. And you guys are on the same size side in uh, Syria. Ah, the derby shouldn't be a shocking one. It's uh, Jose Mourinho versus Mauricio Sarri. Uh, Roma pick them, even money. <laughs> BJ's gone from yeah, not being able to pronounce them to breaking into accents. He's, uh, he's becoming a, the, <laughs> the the beautiful yeah. Iowa Paisan. Yeah, it's it's his. You know what? You might as well keep firing from behind look, the arc, you, Anthony. You don't. You don't. No, just, but you. you don't, this is you don't this is grill. Shy this away is, from from shooting. You don't. You're as a human being. You are intended to grow and to change. And yeah, this is I'm this trying. is BJ. This is BJ I'm growing. Trying. He's growing, and he's he. And next thing you know, he's he's going to be coming here and just doing this entire section in in, in Italian. I was going to say one day we should learn German, Italian, Spanish, French, and do that part yes. of the show in that language. 
to be to be fair to the listeners out there, um, I at one point did speak Spanish, so I do know that language. You know, at least like the pronunciations, at least somewhat well. Um, I have never spoken French or Italian or German, so that is so where you didn't hear Olivier Giroud uh, say tell, tell, Olivier Giroud uh, explain to Jamie Carragher how to say his name is Olivier yeah. Giroud. Yeah. Uh, Anyways, uh, yeah, anyways, yeah, you guys uh, are on, you guys I mean, are on Roma. I mean, this we, is pretty simple. I mean, yeah, you don't need to go into. We don't need to go into too much, but I, what I will say is, in this match last season, the second one, Roma okay. got a red card in the thirty-second minute, and Lazio was only able to create 0.6 xG. I know, like, you'll you'll go to the results, you'll say, "Hey, Lazio won both meetings last year." Uh, even their okay. match against Feyenoord, they were not good. Like, I thought Feyenoord was the way better team in that match, and they. What happened is Lazio got one transition opportunity off a mistake from Feyenoord, and they scored it. And congrats to Shiro Mobile. But outside of that, they didn't really do anything. So, uh, yeah, trying to break down Jose Mourinho's low block, uh, very, very difficult thing to do. And I understand Rome's had some, you know, some injuries to deal with this season, but nobody, nobody walks into Jose's house and, and breaks That's right. Down. That's right. Uh, uh, legal only you BJ. Yeah, uh, I like Nice plus one thirty on the road Friday afternoon against Montpellier. Uh, Francesco Farioli, outstanding man, young manager at Nice right now. They have conceded four goals all season. That's awesome. That's incredibly impressive. Only only eight point three xG allowed, and how they're doing it is incredibly impressive because of how flexible they are with their tactics. They can be a very, very direct team when they face teams like PSG. They're very, very good with their pressing triggers and trying to create traps and and get people moving forward. And they're facing a Montpellier team that, quite frankly, has been overperforming for a really long time. And when they have faced the good competition in France, when they faced Lille, they only created 0.3 XG. Then when they faced PSG last Friday, they only created half an expected goal. So I don't see how they're going to score here against Nice. And Nice has been a very good attack. So... Uh, project Denise at minus 111, so I like the price them at plus 130. Okay, uh, time for our underdog parlay. It's going to come out at a, at a big number. Like I said, 155 to 1. Uh, Anthony, you can go first. Nottingham Forest. I was originally going to do Chelsea, and then I changed course. Uh, I think the trees match up really well here with West Ham. I think West Ham struggles to break down. Uh, you know, teams that are going to sit off and be very passive. And I think given the decline in their attacking numbers, combined with just generally awful defensive numbers, uh, West Ham is live to get picked off again as the matches keep piling up. So with that adjustment, it means that the parlay comes out at 137 at one. Uh, that's what that's what happens when Anthony makes me do math on, on the fly. Uh, I like Luton Town. What's the opposite of a heat check? Like in basketball, they say heat check, like when the guy's like on fire. Yeah, like what? What is it? Uh, there, I, I don't is know. there one? I, that's what I'm doing with United. I just want. I should learn the name because I'm I'm quite bad at basketball. Yeah. Well, whatever whatever the opposite of a heat check is, that's what I'm trying to pull off here with Manchester United, and uh, they could be uh, a little bit of a dead man walking going into this home match against Luton, and what will be a very toxic atmosphere at the theater of dreams bj what about well you? michael i have a special treat for all the people who are watching on youtube and if you're not you should go watch the youtube right now because we're doing this underdog segment and this entire time this whole podcast i've had my dog <laughs> sitting in my lap this entire time so i like real betis plus 265 in the seville derby against sevilla it's a fantastic matchup for them a team that has got a lot more defensive solidity now uh, over the last few years, a team that has overperformed, you know, but they're facing us to be a team that is terrible in transition defense. Can't really stop anything right now. Put up a terrible performance against Arsenal. So I like Real Betis in the Seville Derby plus 265. If, if Betis wins, I think all three of us need to bring our dogs onto the dog yeah. show segment for the rest of the time. And that's why you have to be watching the YouTube of our podcast. Yeah. Well, uh, Elvis is 80 pounds. <laughs> mm, it'd be tough. We'll figure it out. Um, he has a blue nose, though, just like me. And just like my favorite bet, Everton. Uh, I like the Toffees at plus 200 on the road. 
against Crystal Palace. Trying to break the schneid here. Usually when one of Anthony or BJ pick Everton as an underdog or uh, their best bet, they win. And when I do it, it comes out as a homer bias loser. Uh, but I'm going to try to break the schneid here. I think that uh, Palace as a favorite, just vulnerable. Anthony said it earlier. Like I think all three of us power rate uh, or think highly higher of Everton than, than Crystal Palace now at this point. Uh, and they they could like this is a game that you guys were talking about being low event. I think Everton's totally fine in that because they're they have clinical finishers uh, in their lineup now that they're healthy. So uh, give me the toffees at two to one, BJ. Yeah, I like Arsenal, Burnley. Both teams to score no at minus one fifty. I don't know how Burnley is going to score in this match. They're averaging under point nine non penalty expected goals this season. And their style of play is not inducive to what how good Arsenal has been defensively. The teams that have given Arsenal problems are teams that can play in transition, who can really exploit Arsenal and honestly turn them over high as well. Burnley hasn't been good at forcing high turnovers, even though they are pressing with the front four. And they're not a transition-based team. They're a team that wants to build out of the back and progress the ball that way. Playing against an Arsenal team that out of possession is one of the best teams in the world at pressing you and disrupting your build-up play. It's a terrible matchup for Burnley. But Arsenal going to be pretty limited in their attack. No Miguel Odegaard, no Gabriel Jesus, not very many options. And if Burnley decides to play a little bit more passive, Arsenal could struggle. So uh, projected both teams score no at minus 184, so I like the price at minus 150. I think we're becoming a Steve Cooper podcast, slowly but surely. So uh, I used him as my underdog. I think I used him as my underdog and my best bet last week. Or no, my underdog was Dortmund. So use him as my best bet last week, and I'm doing it again. Nottingham Forest plus a half at West Ham. Uh, relative to the market, I think West Ham is now my biggest differentiator in team strength, uh, along with United, of course. But uh, I, I'm just much lower than the market on this West Ham team, and I think uh, their defensive back line continues to get exposed. Okay, well, that'll do it for Wonder Goal. Uh, this week and for a couple weeks as we head into uh, the final international break before things get really busy with all the festive fixtures. Uh, So you'll be hearing a lot from us uh, as we get back. Um, But until then, best of luck with all your bets and hopefully we will cash some uh, big tickets going into the break. 